On the program for this evening's event, I'm called a philosopher. Elsewhere, I've been referred to as a conceptual artist, as an inventor, even a scientist. But none of those really seem to apply to me, given that I don't have any advanced degree or any expertise in anything. And as a result, the best I could come up with for a business card was, as you see, to call myself untitled. <laughs> but if forced to come up with a job description on a resume or something of the sort, I would have to say that I'm a dilettante. Now, I don't mean that in a self-deprecating way. I, I think that actually dilettantism is deeply underrated in our society, and that really the dilettante is in the privileged position in our world of being able to investigate absolutely anything and everything irresponsibly. And the irresponsibility is actually key because it allows for a sort of undisciplined, a, in a very disciplined way, a very undisciplined synthesis and recirculation of ideas such that potentially new ideas arise out of old and you find yourself someplace that you never really would have expected to go. So in order to attempt to um, persuade you that dilettantism has its advantages, um, or at least to persuade myself of that point of view, I'm going to talk to you about a few of my ventures over the years uh, that I think in various ways get across what I mean when I speak of being a dilettante. So back in 2006, I, I went into real estate. A lot of people were doing that. Uh, that was, of course, the boom before the one in which we are currently living. And the only real problem was that I didn't know anything about business. Well, the other problem was I didn't have any money. But those problems put together with the fact that I never had done anything in real estate before made me reckless enough to think that I might be able to get somewhere with it. And partly I think my um, optimism came out of some reading I had been doing in string theory. In string theory you have quite a few dimensions of space, depends on how you're counting them, whether you have six or seven more than the three of space plus time that we ordinarily encounter, or sometimes the numbers get to be quite large. But in any case, the point is that there were all of these dimensions that were going unused by people living in the Bay Area where real estate was booming. And so I thought that what I would do is I would go to them and I would see whether I could perhaps purchase the rights to be able to develop in those extra dimensions of space. Now, this, is, this is not the least bit unprecedented, mind you. Air rights are already in place for working in the third dimension, and so I just used the same legal framework, the same contract, and I found people who were willing for rather low prices. I think that I purchased the rights to develop in the extra dimensions of space on a property in Petrero Hill. I think that the, the, the property had a Zillow price of about a million five hundred thousand. I think I paid. I think it was seven dollars to be able to develop in those extra dimensions. And so then, of course, once I had secured that, what I did is what anybody would do in that sort of enterprising situation, which was that I set up a real estate office. I, I subdivided the properties. I, I had a portfolio of properties, and I then provided people with the opportunity. And instead of building up, as you would with air rights, I, I bolted out. That was the, the theory I was working under. And I figured that this was string, string theory being string theory. It was highly speculative. So therefore, I priced low. I, I had properties that were one millionth the Zillow price. And that meant that you could actually buy a property um, for, I think it was eight cents. No, it was nine. But people put it on their credit card anyway. And so <laughs> I, I think that the reason that people were willing to purchase beyond the fact that the prices were lower than a gumball these days was that I explained the advantages, that this is what you do apparently in real estate. You, you, you accentuate the positive. And 
one positive, perhaps the only one. I think these dimensions, I, I should mention, are very small, the flank link uh, under certain uh, theories, which means that you really can't put plumbing or anything like that. But um, the thing about them is that there actually are quite a lot of them. So that meant, I felt, that you could actually build a house that would be unlike anything here on Earth, a tesseract house. So I made blueprints for my for a four-dimensional home away from home, and I sold these as uh, as vacation properties. Nobody ever goes to their vacation properties anyway, and I I thought that this would be a way in which by enticing them with all that they could build, they would go along with it. And there were quite a few. I think that we got up to nearly a hundred before I got a little bit bored with it, dilettante that I am, and decided to go into filmmaking. That was in 2007. One year later. Um, and I realized that there, there might be some competition. There was uh, Steven Spielberg, for instance, uh, James Cameron, a lot of people already doing it. I didn't want to try to compete with them because I had actually never operated a video camera before. And so I thought that I'd better look for other audiences. And there are other audiences out there that Disney is oblivious to, as far as I can tell, and uh, Miramax, all of them. There are bigger audiences. Uh, if you think about the phylogenetic tree, well, there aren't that many of us in comparison, for instance, to plants. Now, plants sound like they are not um, ideal until you start to think about what they do all day long. Photosynthesis is actually the perfect way in which to be able to experience film, since film is being projected. But of course, I don't know any plants very well, and I didn't really know what they would like. And so this was, as a filmmaker, this was kind of the great conundrum that I was facing. And I realized that, well, a lot of them, they reproduce uh, sexually, and a lot of filmmakers get started in pornography. So I decided that I would make <laughs> pornography for plants. Uh, specifically, I went out and I filmed honeybees pollinating flowers, uh, highly titillating stuff, all amateurs. Um, and I then opened up a porn theater for plants, I believe the first porn theater for plants, in the town of Chico, California, which is an agricultural town, which has the advantages of, a lot of, of there being a lot of plants, and therefore potentially a lot of appreciation. And as you can see, in this case, I had uh, about 90 or so uh, rhododendrons on the floor, and was projecting directly on them so that they could vicariously experience the honeybees that were doing their thing up above. But, as I mentioned before, only some plants reproduce sexually. And also, porn is not considered respectable to everybody. So I decided that I would try to go more legit. Uh, this was several years later, and I was, I guess, starting to feel a bit full of myself as a filmmaker. And so I started thinking about, well, what else might a, a, a plant appreciate? And I thought, one thing about most plants is that they're rooted in the ground, which means they don't get to go anywhere. So travel documentaries would be ideal. Um, but of course, if you're a plant, you're not really interested in the Eiffel Tower, for instance. What you're interested in, I think, is probably the sky. So what I did was I started to film skies in Europe and opened in New York City a, a theater for houseplants, that they could experience the movies that were filmed in Europe, projected onto them. And as you'll see, the, the, the setup here was a little bit different. I, I, dilettante that I am, I still am an attentive dilettante who is very careful to make sure that I work to the utmost for whatever my audience might happen to be, plants included. And as a result, in the case of the pornography, it made a lot of sense to project directly onto the foliage because the bees are right above the plant and therefore from a plant's perspective, pornographically speaking, it makes the most sense to have a highly degraded black and white image that's directly over them. Whereas the sky is, might as well be up in the sky as far as the plant is concerned. They don't really see the clouds or anything like that. I don't need to tell you that here, I guess. But anyway, they don't. And so what I did was I created a system with a scrim that was able to filter the light such that the plants could experience the sky as, as they would, like in aggregate. But in this case, the New York plants were experiencing a sky that was far away in Italy, as it happens. So plants are well and good. But ultimately, 
they are plants, and you can only have so much of a relationship with them. And I, I, it seemed to me that it, relationships between humans actually are potentially sometimes more interesting. But at the same time, relationships between humans are somewhat problematic in some cases. And in, in particular, it seemed to me that um, marriage was highly problematic, largely because of the nature of marriage laws. And that as a dilettante, perhaps I could do something to fix the situation, to help uh, make marriage um, no longer something that was under the auspices of uh, various religious or political authorities. And again, because I was casually reading everything, I had been interested in, in quantum physics, as we all are, but specifically in quantum entanglement. Now, entanglement is actually ideal when you think about it, in, at least in some terms, when you're thinking about marriage. Because in the case of entanglement, what you have are two or more particles when they're entangled. They are as if they were one, even if they're a universe apart. As far as marriage is concerned, that sounds pretty romantic. So I figured that what I could do would be to take advantage of entanglement, basically to allow people to become entangled rather than married, to operate under a law of nature rather than a local law of California. And that what would make that possible, in fact, very easy, I wouldn't even need to be there, which is, of course, always an advantage, was I could build a, uh, a machine. I could build specifically a, um, what I called an entanglement engine, though there were no moving parts. Uh, essentially what this is, is a, uh, a, a non-linear crystal which will entangle photons and a beam splitter. And so what you end up with are two beams of sometimes entangled photons, which by the photoelectric effect, if people stand under the engine, they will become entangled. At least there is some potential that some atoms will, by the photoelectric effect, become entangled. And the beauty of it is that you just don't know. In fact, that's built into the physics. And this is, I think, where it really gets romantic. Because in the case of any quantum system, when you measure it, that measurement will, will degrade or cause the, 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 in the case of entanglement, will cause the, the particles or the people to become disentangled. So as a result, beyond the fact that I can't be wrong in this case because nobody can check, because <laughs> inherently this is um, exactly what you're looking at, a, for the people who are getting entangled, there is the advantage that they can't check, and therefore that they need to maintain this level of faith, really that's the only word for it, in their entangled state, lest it have, through skepticism about their relationship, the effect that they become disentangled, which would be tragic. And so <laughs> these, these examples I, I put forward as three different case studies, I guess, which I then, since I think I have a few minutes left, do I have any minutes left? I have six minutes left. So just to flash through a few other things, uh, because Piero was very kind to allude to the fact that I'm up to all sorts of strange things. Um, other projects that I have been engaged in, uh, other ventures, uh, operating in this way where I put everything together and see what happens. I, I um, for instance, um, attempted to genetically engineer God. Um, this was at UC Berkeley, it was not at Stanford, uh, but this was an attempt actually to figure out where on the phylogenetic tree amongst all the various species, where, where God might be, and not being able to obtain any DNA for God, I ended up needing to undertake a system of um, continuous in vitro evolution where over a period of time I was able to measure for incipient godliness, and to answer your question, uh, we published our research and uh, are hoping for others to join in and refute it at least. Uh, but <laughs> so this 
of course, being an example of what happens when science and religion start mixing up in ways that are um, not really intended or necessarily considered desirable to either one of them. I've also attempted to um, fix the problem of always being late, never having time for anything. Uh, that is to say that I applied um, general relativity to time management. Uh, this is quite recently. I, I uh, provided time ingots for people that would, by relativity, ever so slightly, emphasis on the ever, the so, and the slightly, um, warp time such that if you kept one of these on your desk and your colleagues didn't have them on their desk, you would be operating in a time frame that would be, um, well, you would be managing your time. It would be, uh, your time frame would be such that your clock was running slower. So um, another example was my attempt to um, undertake human cloning uh, epigenetically uh, in order to allow people to become the historical figures and the <laughs> celebrities as well that they most admired. Basically the idea here, very briefly, being that you um, you take the chemical environment in which uh, a given historical figure or celebrity you might admire grew up in and you expose yourself or somebody else to that environment. In this case, Napoleon, uh, we have things such as arsenic and lead and mercury and various other nasty things. And epigenetically speaking, you end up with a clone. In, in the same way that, that twins, genetically speaking, will drift apart in time, the idea is that epigenetically, two genetically distinct beings will become clones of each other. And actually, a few people bought into this uh, buying some cheap pills that I provided that allowed them to become clones of me, in other words, more dilettantes. And finally, we have, uh, because I do occasionally dabble in something like art, um, my attempt here to make art, to make paintings and sculpture, and, but really wanting it to be universal, um, Copernican in other words. So as a result, what I did was I, I went according to the mediocrity principle, and I made my paintings um, the average color of the universe, the color blurry. Um, and the sculptures were made out of the most uh, common element that we have, that we, that we know, is hydrogen. Uh, these are not the sculptures, by the way. This is the sculpture before it's been released. When it has been released, it becomes much, much more interesting. <laughs> so I will end where I began by saying that I think that there are ways in which when you start to mix things up, you end up in interesting places that you didn't expect to be. For instance, in the case of uh, the real estate project, I think that there are ways in which when you put string theory into practice, it gets to be a little bit uncomfortable in terms of what we think about when we think about a theory. What do we mean when we speak of a theory in terms of whether your theory and practice get you to a, a point of untestability. What does it mean philosophically to be at that point? And what does it mean when people actually have to experience it by spending their money on it? At the same time, this reflects on real estate, which has got to be even stranger than string theory. The idea that you can own the land that was there before you and will be there once again after you are long gone. Does that mean I'm done? <laughs> um, so, or, for instance, in the case of um, quantum marriage, where you have quantum mechanics, which has got to be one of the, well, quantum strangeness is famously strange. What happens when you make it, you integrate it into your life? Is there a way in which, by changing the, how we live, that the strangeness of quantum mechanics no longer is so strange, and the way in which we've been living maybe seems a bit stranger, and especially things such as the standards of marriage, suddenly start to fall apart and come together in other ways. So there's a lot to be done, and I leave it to you, I leave it to others to do it, and also I leave with the, um, with the encouragement that all of you consider at least becoming dilettantes part-time um, as, as a matter of being able to undertake other investigations that I haven't thought of or I don't have time to speak about tonight. And anybody who does so, I will happily provide them with the uh, templates so that they too can have appropriate business cards. Thank you.